Welcome to Victorious Living with Pastor Charles Cowan. Now let's join Pastor Cowan and the congregation of Faith is the Victory Church. This is Victorious Living. Amen. We've been talking and sharing with you over the last couple of Sundays on the, the uh, strongholds of the mind. Of course, that's where all strongholds occur is in the mind. We've been talking to you about that. You can have a, you can have a good stronghold or you can have one that's not so good or not so right. And all strongholds develop sometimes out of the patterns of our habits. Amen. You know, you've got habits that you go through every morning when you get up, perhaps, probably. And uh, you, you kind of do them subconsciously. You don't necessarily think about it. You do it because you have formed a stronghold in your mind or you get up in the morning and you are just kind of in a subconscious way, not, not totally, but you just begin to praise God. Anybody in here, when you get out of the bed in the morning, you just start to praise God. You have built a habit of doing that, but there is also a stronghold that's developed and you just do it. And so there are, there are good strongholds that come out of the habits that we form in life. Our habits and p patterns, obviously, around the Word of God. And uh, then there are strongholds that the adversary brings in our pathway. And life itself brings to us. And Satan's desire is to plant that uh, stronghold in your mind so that it takes root in your mind and you're thinking about it when you're not even thinking to think about it. <laughs> you know, you just start to think about it. Yes, we do. Amen. And that's true for any of us. So today I want to talk to you and share with you from the word the importance of a submitted will to our faith. How important our submitted will. Now, keep in mind that God's not going to force you to be submitted. He's not going to make us be submitted to him. But yet his will is that we be submitted to him. His will is that we exercise uh, the faith that he has given us from the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And so he's not going to make us do any, any, anything, but yet at the same time, he wants everybody to come and follow him and live according to his will because it's to our advantage to do so. So we're going to talk about, we, when we get down to it, we're going to talk about, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. But there are two kinds or two patterns of, of, of will that we have. There are two patterns of, of the will that we can follow in life. Obviously, number one is the will of God. But yet on the other side of the ledger, there is man's self-will. We all, you know, out of, out of the, uh, the habits, out of the flesh side, our natural flesh side, there are habits and patterns we can develop from that side of life as well. So we, we, we are to, as Paul tells us in the Roman letter, he tells us that we are to renovate or to renew our thinking, that we're not to be conformed to the, to the thinking of the world system, but we are to be uh, conformed to God's thinking, of course, obviously that comes out of and from his word. We know that. And uh, so we can have whichever one we want, or maybe sometimes there's something about it that we don't know. And so because we don't know, what we don't know could hurt us. What we do know sometimes is the answer. We find the answer to our, our situations. So there are two kinds of will. There's God's will and self-will. And being in a flesh body, it's easier to follow the will of the flesh because Satan ever uses that to direct us or to take us in a certain direction where our life 
is concerned. So God's people, those of us who are, who are God's children, God's people have to choose between God's will and their self-will. And God will let us take either side. He'll let us do that. But taking the wrong side obviously is not his will or his uh, desire for our life. But nonetheless, God will let you. He will let all of us do, do that. So we all have the right to choose which will we follow or allow to shape our life, whether it's God's will or whether it's our own self will. And so we've all, we all have the natural side always has something uh, that pertains to the will of the flesh. And God always has a will that pertains to the spirit of God, to the word of God, or to the God who lives on the inside of us. So self-will, in contrast to God's will, uh, will oppose, self-will will always oppose the will of God. So there is a fight. You know, Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. So there is a battle. We're not preaching it to you like it's always easy. But there is a battle and there's a fight. He says, fight that good fight of faith. If we don't control our will and our thoughts, then we'll lose the battle. So he said, fight the good fight of faith. And so willing or unwilling centers in the individual's God-given right to choose right or wrong. We have that God-given right. That doesn't mean that God uh, uh, advocates the wrong choices, but he gives us the right to choose. And so what we need to learn, we need to learn what is the will of God. And we need to learn what would God have us to choose so that God can direct and guide us throughout our life. So we don't want to follow self-will. We want to follow God's will for ourselves. And so we see willing or unwilling centers in the individual, individual's God-given right to choose right or wrong. And until the one who is a Christian voluntarily submits to the known will of God, it keeps God for the most part on the sidelines, as it were. Now, let me say that again. Notice in that I said the known will of God. Nobody can follow the will of God if they don't know what it is. So once we find out the will of God, which we mostly find in the word of God, then God has encouraged us to choose that path for our life. Why? Not because that he's a tyrant, simply because he has something in our life and uh, ahead of our life to bless us with in his will. And so we see then to know the will of God for our existence on the earth. Why are you here? I'm not just talking about here in this building. Why are you here on the earth? What's your purpose? What's the reason that you're here? Why did God create us? So the known will of God becomes a vital component of having faith that moves God or having faith that receives from God and having faith to live by faith where God is concerned. So your will, your choosing, your knowledge of God and his will becomes so vital and so important to you that it means life or death. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about physical death, but I'm talking about habits and patterns of life that are anti or opposed to God, you can live and have a life in the physical body, but yet be experiencing things that are classified as death. And so it's important to know the will of God for our existence. That's the reason for teaching. You know, I heard a preacher say just recently, he said, the teaching movement is over. And so I thought, well, that put Jesus out of business, didn't it? You know, the Bible said that he came and he preached and he taught and revealed who he was and revealed the word of God through his teaching and through his preaching. So if I close an ear to God, God's teaching, 
to the teaching of the word of God and close ear to those things that God is saying then. I have no hope of ever walking where God wants me to walk. So let's start here this morning in 2 Corinthians here in the time I got, I have here on Sunday morning. And we'll read 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses three and four. Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hidden to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who, what, believe not. Now think about that just for a moment. Where does Satan work on you first? He works on your will. What are you willing to do in your relationship with God? Are you willing to follow the precepts that he outlines in his word? What are you willing to do? And so he says, if our gospel be hid, it is hidden to them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So God wants to project or get the word in us so that it forms a picture. It forms an image of how God sees you. And it forms an image of what God wants to, or how God wants to bless you. And it forms an image of what God wants to bless you with. And so he said, if, if, uh, if, if the gospel be hid, if the good news of Jesus be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Or we could say it's hid to those who understand not. It is hid to those who are lost uh, in whom the God of the world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Now in these two verses here, in these two verses we see that Satan has the ability to blind the mind uh, uh, to God's will through putting pressure on man's self-will as to what is right and what is wrong. So sometimes we can convince ourselves something that's wrong we can convince ourselves that it's right. We can convince, well, God doesn't pay attention to that. But God sees, God knows, and God understands all things, everything. Now let's go over into the book of Hebrews just for a moment as we're talking about the importance of a submitted will. Now remember this, that no one can submit your will but you. I can't submit your will for you. I can't do that. You can't submit your will. Someone else cannot submit uh, your will or cause you to submit to, uh, to the will of God. I can't do that. But yet at the same time, the preaching and the teaching of the word gives us instructions of how to do it and what to, what to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verses two and three. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end of our faith. So we keep in mind this, this, this well-known teaching that we've heard through many, many years that God, that Jesus is the author of faith. He's the author of the God kind of faith. He's the originator of the God kind of faith. Jesus is God here in the flesh who walked by faith in the will of God. And so we understand that, that, that he is. Jesus is the author. He's the finisher of our faith. If Satan can distract me away from Jesus, you know, it's like I had a person here oh, two or three years ago, three or four years ago, telling me that, hey, do you not know that the Bible is 2,000 years old? And so it's a book that is outdated and needs to be brought up to date. And so that was the instruction that, uh, or the comment that was made. No, it has been around a long time. In fact, uh, God used it to create the world. So it never grows old. It never has an era. It's still the same today because God is what? He's the what? Same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes 
not. I think sometimes we may try to change God, but God is in the business when we submit to him to, to change us in the way. So Jesus is the author and he's the finisher of our faith. Now watch this, who for the joy that was set before him. Now he's looking at the cross and he, he knows his journey here on earth. He knows the plan and the will of God here in the earth. He came to seek and save that which was lost. So he knows what's out in front of him. But look what, look what he said, who for the joy that was set before him. Now you take people today sometimes, not everybody, uh, maybe not you or me or whomever. But one thing that we can do sometimes when we face situations and circumstances in life, we have a choice. We can choose to rejoice in God and in the will of God, no matter what it looks like out here. So Jesus said, who for the joy that was set before him. We've all read, you know, the severity of his punishment that he took in taking the sins of the world. We know the horribleness of the, of the beating and, the, and of the treatment and of the crucifixion, but it said, who for the joy? God, our Jesus, he saw the end of the will of God that man be saved. He saw the end of the will of God that God bless you. He saw the end of the will of God to protect you and to preserve you and to keep you in a place of safety from harm. He saw that, so he's willing to go and do what he did just for you. Amen. Just for you, had you in mind. What's the song? When he was on the cross. Anybody heard that song? When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And you know what? God still got you on his mind. God's got the whole world on his mind. God hasn't forgotten you. You may feel like God has forgotten you. You may feel like that God doesn't hear you. You may feel like that God's a thousand miles away. You may have all kind of feelings and emotions from the natural side, but God knows right where you're at. God knows right where you're at. It's like Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. He knew where Paul and Silas was at. They had been beaten and you know the story. They were mistreated, but guess what? God knew where they were at. So what did Paul and Silas choose to do? They chose in a moment that looked bad and was bad. They chose to look to the author and the finisher of their faith, to the God, hallelujah, that would deliver them out of all of the situation and circumstances they had to face, he, God knew where they were at and he delivered them out of the Philippian jail. He'll deliver you out of your jail. He'll deliver you out of your bondage. He'll deliver you out of, out of whatever situation you're going through. If you just choose to choose, choose to choose his will for your life. And a lot of times that's just for the joy that's set before us. We're just going to have to praise God when it looks the darkest going to have to praise God when it looks bleak. We're going to have to look to God when it looks like it's impossible. For with God, nothing is impossible. God can do all things according to his will, his plan, and his purpose for my life and for your life. Let's keep thinking about deeper revelations and let's operate in the revelation that we have that will sustain us through life. Amen. Hallelujah. And so looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him, now watch this third verse, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied lest you become weary, lest you faint, talking about all of us, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. What's he saying? Letting go of the thoughts of God, the plan of God, the victory that God has purchased for us. Letting go, we become weary and let it go. And so what do we do? We have then left our self-will in control of our journey through life. He said, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint 
in your mind. We'll touch on that a little bit later if we have time. So what happens when a person faints in the natural? You ever fainted in the natural? That's three of you. Okay. How many have ever fainted? How many of you ashamed to say you fainted? How many of you just ain't going to say you ever fainted? We've all probably have, you know. How did you feel when you were fainting? Moment, momentarily, what you did, you begin to lose consciousness. You begin to lose your thought patterns and you feel like you're going. You know, you don't know where, but well, you do. If you die, you're going to go to heaven. But you just feel like you're leaving. You're fainting. You forgot, you've forgotten many things at that moment in time. And that's what he's telling us, that when we faint and become weary, we forget sometimes what we've learned. We forget, we forget the word that's been so taught and preached and then established in our own minds until such situations cause you to become weary and faint and lose consciousness of God being right there with you, of God being your deliverer, and of God being your redeemer through Christ, amen. So what happens when a person faints in the natural? They temporarily lose consciousness of their thoughts and of their awareness of their surroundings. They lose it. So when we faint spiritually, we at a point in time lose consciousness of the word that we have received through the years. And so it seems to want to leave our mind. And so natural fainting as well as spiritual fainting has its greatest effect on the mind. When you faint in the spirit, that fainting occurs in your thoughts and in your mind because of situations and circumstances that you may be surrounded with, situations and circumstances that Satan has brought to your life, you can faint on the spur of the moment if you allow yourself to do so. So here he said uh, uh, in, that, in that verse, third verse of the 12th chapter of Hebrews, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind or lose consciousness of what you know. And Satan can do it to all of us. You know, I'm amazed sometimes that people tell me sometimes, not often, but sometimes through the years have told me, well, he can't do any of that to me. Talking about Satan's attacks. Yes, he can. He attacks us all at certain times and certain points in our life. And so God has given us the right to choose. You can choose whatever you want to choose. But the Bible says choose life. God tells us to choose life that you and your seed might live. So our choices are so, so important and our will submitted to the will of God has great, tremendous effect upon our faith. So choices originate, as I've said, in in our mind and choices are developed or come into fruition in our words and actions. When we lose control of the mind of Christ, then it will begin to show itself in my words and in my actions. And so we, we, we have experienced that. I say we have, pe- people have experienced that through time. Choices are made on the basics of information we receive and the experiences of our life. Let me say that again, that we make choices based on information, the basics uh, of information that we have received and the experiences of our life. So it's crucial that you understand what you receive from, from the word. So the mind, your mind, our mind, the mind is the seat of our will. That's where we make decisions is in our mind. The mind becomes the seat of the will. The, the, the will is to be shaped by the word of God. But our mind is the seat. It's the place of origination of our, our will. And so our thinking becomes the catalyst that precipitates the actions of our will. 
uh, what did I say? How did I say that our, our free will, our thinking rather, becomes the catalyst that precipitates the action of our free will. Amen. So our free will gives us the right to choose. You can choose whatever you want to choose. God will give you the right to do that, but it doesn't necessarily that you should do some of the things that we may think about doing. We are to choose life. Therefore, choose life. A amen. And so our free will gives us the right to choose as we please. You can choose anything you want. You can choose here today and go out and rob a bank, but I don't think you'll do that because they're closed. <laughs> so that, that temptation's by the board today. <laughs> Amen, but you can choose to, you know, when you leave here today to do whatever you want to do. Thank you so much for viewing the program with us today. We trust that the word of the Lord has blessed your heart. We were talking, as you know, about the importance of a submitted will to our faith. You know, there's God's will, and then there is man's will, the two, two wills. And what we have to do is we have to bring our will, which is man's will, into agreement with God's will. And so there in itself is a real key to walking in faith. So how I submit my human will, my, my will to God's will, will determine the level and the degree of faith that I walk in. And so it's so important to have a submitted will to the will of God. And of course, we find the will of God uh, in the scriptures, as we read the scriptures, uh, then the will of God is projected to us from his word. So we hope you enjoyed that. And if you'd like a copy of it, as I've said, you can have it by just calling the number on the screen, writing the address on the screen, emailing us, however it's convenient for you. And we'll, we'll ship uh, whichever one you want, CD or DVD. We'll get it to you. Postage paid, no cost. We just want to be a blessing to your life. So God bless you. Thanks again for viewing the program. And we'll see you again right here here next time on Victorious Living. You've been watching Victorious Living with Pastor Charles Cowan. It's our hope that today's message has ministered to the need you have in your life. If you would like to receive today's message in its entirety, please call 1-800-842-7896. Or if you're in the Nashville area, call 615-226-2145 and ask for the product number on the screen. Visit us online at victoriousliving.org. If you're ever in the Nashville area, come and worship with us. Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. From Pastor Cowan and the Congregation of Faith is the Victory Church, we'll be looking for you next time right here on Victorious Living.